sorry I don't love you A phrase I've grown accustomed to Cause with you something isn't wrong Something isn't wrong Something isn't right I wish you could be high. Hey everyone, welcome to Geekdom is Back and this episode is sponsored by Vinyl Me Please. You can join their Record of the Month Club at joinvmp.com forward slash geekdom. I'll have that link in the show notes so you guys don't have to memorize it or anything. It, it's pretty easy, but still, it's more convenient if you can just go click on that. And today, we are going to be talking all about the Wonder Years, the pop punk band, not the TV show. And Scott Fuger is back. He was on our Marvel Unlimited episode last. So, Scott, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm definitely excited. The Wonder Years are definitely among the top three bands, so I have a lot to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw your tweets about you preparing for the podcast. I was like, wow, I did not realize you had seen them that many times live and that you had so many different variants of their records on vinyl and everything. So I'm definitely expecting this to be a interesting and enlightening conversation for me because <laughs> while I listen to the band, I'm clearly not nearly as big of a fan as you are. So I think I have a lot to learn about this band still. <laughs> and I think what we're going to do here is we're going to just go ahead and start from the top and then run through everything chronologically. I feel like that's sort of really the best way you can get to know an artist, because if you don't know too much about them, it always helps to go back and listen to their first album, sort of see where they started from. And I actually did that earlier today because I had not heard their very first album get stoked on it. So yeah. why don't you tell us a little bit about the band getting started and that album since you probably know more about it than I do just from, you know, me only giving it one listen. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they actually started off as a joke band. Um, most of the members, um, Soupy, the singer, Nick, who's now the third guitarist and keyboardist, and Matt, who's the lead guitarist, they were all in a band called The Premiere, um, which is sort of like a more like indie emo type band. Um, and then one day they just like, for fun, um, wanted to get a bunch of friends together and they wrote a song about space, uh, just to have fun. And they um, were planning on playing it at like, in between sets at local shows. Just as sort of a fun thing, like grab the other band's gear and just play the song, have people go crazy, and then have it be over with. So eventually, that sort of backfired on them. They were like, they had so much fun doing it. They wrote a couple more songs, and then they released a split. They released another split, and then they got label interest. And they're like, wait, but this isn't a serious <laughs> band. They're like, this isn't what we're trying to do. But you know, they just decided to kind of run with it um so get stoked on it is definitely you know a far departure from even the upsides the album that came after it and the band has somewhat disowned it um yeah i mean it's basically like that first song they wrote about space it's just like silly pop punk jams that are just you know kind of fun to listen to and jump around to but don't have a whole lot of substance compared to their later work <laughs> yeah and my first impression when listening to Get Stoked On It was that there was a lot of potential there for the band, but I felt like they didn't quite have the sound that everyone sort of knows them for down just yet. And I noticed, too, a lot of the songs on that album seem to be at a more faster pace, kind of in line with a bunch of punk songs, more so than pop punk. And when I was listening to it, it seemed like there was a lot more like yelling and shouting and screaming in that album than we get in some of the more recent stuff. Do you think that because of the fact they were sort of just messing around when they made this, they didn't really have any sort of direction they had planned to go in with it? Yeah, I think it was kind of just like, you know, them writing it out to see where it could take them and not really having a whole bunch of forethought. Um, Sort of the only little ink kernel of what would come to be the Wonder Years, I feel like, is the last song, um, When Keeping It Real Goes Wrong. 
it has sort of that tinge of personal, you know, like these lyrics are about me and about my life and about what's shitty with my life. It has, so it has that little hint, which sort of they took and expanded upon in the next EP, Won't Be Pathetic Forever. And then it kind of fully came to fruition with the upsides. Yeah. And speaking of Won't Be Pathetic Forever, I think that's sort of when more people started to pay attention to the band, too. Even though it was only an EP, I think that sort of gave people a reason to really pay attention to this band. And they're, you know, one of the many Philly bands that have <laughs> popped up in the last. I don't even know, decade or so, probably, because Get Stoked On It was what, like, it was back in the mid to late 2000s, like 2007, I want to say, right? Something like that. I'm not positive of the year either, but definitely around there. <laughs> yeah. So even though the Wonder Years don't feel like a really old band or anything, they've been doing this for a decade, basically. And that's a good run. They had their 10-year show a couple of years ago um, where they played three nights, each album in full that were out at the time. <laughs> yeah, and it's sort of crazy to think of how far they've come to because I know we'll probably talk about what happened with No Sleep, which I don't actually know any details on that. I don't know if you do, but at some point, you know, things just weren't working out with No Sleep and then they moved on to Hopeless Records and it feels like they definitely had this sort of renewed interest in putting their best foot forward and just making these really good albums. But before we get to the switch to Hopeless, we have the upsides to talk about. And I think this is definitely the album where people were like, okay, we need to pay attention to this band. <laughs> and it's where they really started to figure out their sound and the kind of band that they wanted to be, I think. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the upsides from what I've sort of gathered through interviews and everything, it was like they were kind of finishing up college as they were writing it. And they're like, OK, this is kind of going to be our last shot. Um, you know, we'll put everything we have into these songs. And if it takes off, then that's amazing. If it doesn't, then, well, I think they're kind of planning on calling it quits. Um, and so, you know, like the songwriting is takes that whole personal feeling that the Wonder Years are known for. And that's like really what established it, you know, looking inward at yourself and sort of, you know, seeing shortcomings and seeing that also life isn't always that bad. And, you know, it was sort of like a rallying cry almost for, especially like it hit me kind of like in the, towards the tail end of high school. And it was definitely like, you know, it felt so relatable and like, oh, these songs are, about me so i mean that's definitely like signal the change and i think that is really something that like connected to so many people and is the reason for them sort of being able to blow up the way they have yeah and they definitely stay true to sort of their pennsylvania roots basically because they recorded this album in Fairless Hills, Pennsylvania. I don't know exactly where that is. I know I went to school in Philadelphia and I probably should know a little more about the state than I actually do. But at the very beginning of their career, they were very centered around Philadelphia and that scene and everything like that. And you get glimpses of that in their songs. And I didn't get into The Wonder Years quite as early as you did. I think it wasn't until Suburbia that I really knew much about the band. And then I went back and listened to The Upsides. And clearly, I missed out on Get Stoked On It until literally today, <laughs> which I think that was okay. But you have songs on this like Logan Circle, Melrose Diner, and It's Never Sunny in South Philadelphia. So you can tell that they're definitely homers, basically. They really focus a lot on that scene, and they've done a lot for that scene, too. And I think a lot of that really started with the upsides, even though Won't Be Pathetic Forever was kind of a little bit of a launching point for them. I, I don't know if people really talk about Get Stoked On It that much, and I think <laughs> the upsides might sort of be the real start for the band, essentially. Like, this is where they made a name for themselves in the local scene and everything. And 
you know, they received pretty high scores on this for sites like Absolute Punk, Alternative Press, Punk News, and All Music even. So this kind of put them on the map, basically. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I feel like the Upsides is where they really, like, refined their sound. Um, I mean, just looking at, like, um, it's always, or it's never sunny in South Philadelphia, and, um, oh, what's the other song? <laughs> oh, I can't think. Whatever, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but, like, they, that's where they started, like, bringing in these, like, crazy drum parts that are, like, really resonant and, like, make you want to air drum, and it's, like, that is such an important piece of the one year sound to me um and you know obviously like the personal the personality of their lyrics and you know sort of you mentioned before they had sort of a edge to some of their sound on especially on get stoked on it um sort of like bringing taking that out and making it a little more clean cut um but also more emotionally raw like that really kind of changed the game i feel like and um also right before the upsides um their original keyboardist mike kelly left the band and then right after the upsides came out their drummer mike kennedy left the band and they brought in nick steinborn and then like three weeks later mike realized oh this was so stupid why would i do this so he rejoined the band and nick switched over to third guitar and keyboard and that's what we have today now which is kind of a crazy convoluted member change <laughs> Yeah, and Get Stoked on It was 2007, so I'm glad I actually <laughs> correctly <laughs> remembered that. But the Upsides didn't come out until January of 2010, so they had a bit of a gap there to work on their sound and sort of figure out what exactly they wanted to do. And I think that was a good choice for them. And we know right now they're also taking their time on what they're working on next and everything like that. But this album charted on two different charts for Billboard. It hit number nine on the Heat Seekers charts and then 42 on the Independent Albums chart. So they definitely had something on their hands with this. And you see it in songs like All My Friends Are In Bar Bands, where they have Shane Henderson from Valencia, they have Nick from Man Overboard, and they have a bunch of other singers that sort of fit in that same group that they're in. And there's just sort of this camaraderie a lot in pop punk too, especially when you have a very specific scene like the Philly music scene or whether it's, you know, even Ohio now we're seeing a lot of bands come out of there and they sort of all just really support each other. And I think they were able to capture that with this record. And that is sort of what gave them that boost they needed to take that next step and you know, really take this more seriously and realize that they can make something out of it. Yeah, for sure. And it like really paid off immediately because the upsides came out in January, I believe. And then I think it was by May or something, they'd switched to hopeless. Yeah. And I do want to talk about some of the songs on this album just because I feel like there are a lot of songs you could pull off of this and be like, okay, you know, these are great songs. And Logan Circle is one of the big ones. Do you have any particular favorites from this album? Um, I would say my favorite to see live is definitely All My Friends Are In Bar Bands because yeah. they don't really play it much anymore because they have even better closers now. But um, it would just be insanity every time I saw it live. You know, all the members of all the other bands that played coming out on stage to sing along to those final uh verses and like it was just like so awesome and then as far as lyrically um probably say it's never sunny in south philadelphia is my favorite um he has actually have some of the lyrics tattooed on me um yeah i just like it's sort of throughout the album is like a muted positivity that i like really connect with you know like yeah stuff kind of sucks but also it's not that bad when you look at it the right way so um I don't know, sort of take, I know they had a hoodie that said like realist pop punk. And I feel like that is so true. And so me too. <laughs> yeah. And there are actually multiple versions of this album too, which I want to talk about quickly, because 
when they signed with Hopeless, they did a deluxe reissue. So that added four more songs to the album. And, you know, they have a campfire version of Dynamite Shovel and a play on Logan Circle with Logan Circle, A New Hope. Since you have so many of their records on vinyl, was this one of those albums where you sort of got every version of it that came out? Because not only did they do that, but then they did a second reissue for the album in 2015. So do you have all the versions of this album? I believe I currently have every like of the regular pressings. I don't have the record releases or any test press of it. Okay. I have all the colors of the Hopeless version, the colors of the No Sleep version, and the deluxe reissue that has the four extra songs plus a bonus seven inch. And then I have, they did the four bonus songs on a seven inch, which I have those. And they have the bonus seven inch leaving house 1130. I actually have the original metal stampers and acetate for that, along with the test press, the friends press and the regular press. So that's, that's pretty much a yes. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and it's awesome to see them still cater to the fans because there are always going to be fans like you who will buy every variant of, you know, every release pretty much. And while some people might think that's a money grab or something like that, I think it's just sort of one of those things where it's like, okay, you can either pick one of the variants or you can choose to collect all of them. And I think for anyone who is a vinyl collector, that's something that's more understandable to them than it would be from someone looking in from the outside who doesn't collect vinyl. Because while I don't collect variants, mostly because, you know, money is a thing. (laughs) (laughs) And and I don't have enough of it to do that. But for me, you know, I play my records. So when you go to play the upsides, do you have to sort of sit there and be like, okay, which version do I want to play? Do I want to see this variant or this variant? Or do you just sort of have one that you play and the rest are more for collecting? Um, I sort of usually try to, you know, rotate with which version I use so it doesn't get super worn down. Um, okay. But I believe that the deluxe reissue that came out on No Sleep a couple of years ago, I'm pretty sure that those were, at least the digital files that came with it, were slightly remastered. Okay. So sometimes I'll put that on. It sounds, the drums especially are a little more crisp. Um, I'm not fully sure which version I prefer, but, you know, <laughs> it's always good to have options. Yeah, and there are some people who will collect vinyl and then never play it, which I've never really understood that because I'm like, if I'm going to spend this much money on a record, I'm going to want to at least listen to it. And I might not use my record player quite as much as I would like simply because my music listening habits have been very weird since I started listening to podcasts and even weirder since I started doing podcasts of my own. And I think it's cool to see that you are definitely buying all these variants and enjoying all of them. They're not just sort of sitting on a shelf and you're like, hey, I have these, but I don't really do anything with them. For sure. (laughs) Um, And actually going back to what you were saying sort of about, you know, how they like pay attention to their fans and what they want. um, They actually, they do that like so much with everything they do. Like they have some of the coolest merch. Like I have a Hank the Pigeon plushie. I have a photo book they did and two poem books that Dan put out. And, you know, like recently they've started doing VIP uh, Q and A's every tour along with um, like fan request sets. So, you know, lots of times if you're a hardcore fan, you'll want to hear like a random B side and, you know, they'll pull like, I think it's three songs out of a hat and they'll kind of just play whatever the fans want. So it's like, really awesome to me how much they you know like care about the fans and care about the fan experience and making sure that you know they're not just like a rock star like the legends of the 80s and stuff they're like real people and they really you know their music is personal and they also thrive on those personal connections yeah and 
that sort of brings us into suburbia. I've given you my all and now I'm nothing, which we'll probably just call suburbia moving forward because that's a little bit of a mouthful. <laughs> and this is when they made their switch to Hopeless. And Hopeless is a label that's been around for quite a while now. And I think they definitely have a lot more manpower behind them than No Sleep does. Because as far as I understand, No Sleep is mostly one person and then people help out here and there. Whereas Hopeless, they have, you know, an office up in Van Nuys and they have quite the team of people at that office. And I don't know if anyone really works remotely there or not, but that's besides the point. And I think this was a good move for them. And like I said, I don't know much of what happened between the band and No Sleep. Do you know anything about that? Or is it sort of just something they've never really talked about? Um, I mean, I think for a while, like a lot of bands, it seemed like were getting upstreamed from No Sleep to Hopeless. I don't think there were really any issues when the switch happened. But okay. um, more recently, I think there's been some a little bit of tension as it comes to like reissuing physical stuff, um, like when the Sleeping on Trash uh, collection of like past songs came out. Yeah, I'm not sure that they were totally behind that. I know they were like really against um, and have stopped any like physical reissue of get stoked on it um but yeah so i think it's more of like that kind of tension uh, like controlling their back catalog than you know anything like personal <laughs> yeah and you let me know when i was looking for get stoked on it that there's actually two separate artists on apple music for the wonder years i mean both say the wonder years but it's sort of split up to the releases that the band doesn't really have anything to do with anymore. And then their more recent stuff with Suburbia, Greatest Generation, and No Closer to Heaven, and, you know, a few other things here and there. So it's interesting to me because I feel like that's sort of a disservice for the fans. And, you know, you just mentioned how they do a lot of stuff for the fans. So it's kind of sad to see that because of this, you know, disagreement or whatever you want to call it that they have with how the back catalog is being handled fans have to go to places to find their music and i don't know if it's the same on spotify necessarily since i don't use that or any other streaming services really but it'll be interesting to see if you know that ends up being combined again somewhere down the line yeah i mean they when they first decided to like kind of disown get stoked on it they were like really staunchly against it um, but actually, you know, I like the 10 year shows that they did. The encore set every night was a couple songs from Get Stoked On It and around that time period. So th and I think at the um, like VIP sessions, they aren't as opposed as they used to be with playing that stuff. So they've, you know, they're starting to kind of get more comfortable with the fact that, you know, fans enjoy that music, even if they don't personally, you know, think it's their best work or anything. I think they're kind of coming around maybe a, a little bit, getting more comfortable with it. Yeah, and with Suburbia, this is where things really started to get going for them. They landed at number th 73 on the Billboard 200 charts, which for anyone who doesn't pay attention to those, that's kind of one of the main charts for Billboard. It's just the top 200 albums. And I want to talk about this album a little more in depth because this is sort of when I started to get into the band and Came Out Swinging is just one of those openers that you sort of really remember because even though it doesn't look like it was released at as a single, it was a song that stuck with you from the moment you heard it. Would you agree that this is definitely one of their stronger openers? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, just like the feedback at the beginning and then like the basically explosion of the song. It's like it's so great. And I never understand why when they play live, they use it as a closer. It seems like a no brainer as the perfect opener for me. So I'm like, I don't get it. I just want I want the set to start off that way with like a crazy explosion. I mean, the sing along at the end like leads itself to a closer, but I feel like it would just work even better as an opener as it does on the album. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm 
pretty sure I've seen them live at least once or twice. And I don't know if that necessarily caught on with me, but I feel like that would almost be like if Green Day started their set with Good Riddance. You know, <laughs> it's just like that kind of doesn't make too much sense, especially at the beginning of a set. It definitely makes sense at the end of a set, which I think that's one of the songs they almost always do towards the end, if not as the final song. And with this, the singles released from this were Local Man Ruins Everything, Don't Let Me Cave In, and Coffee Eyes. And it's actually interesting to me that they didn't use Came Out Swinging as a single because I feel like that's one of the songs that people remember the most from this album. And this album came out fairly quickly after The Upsides. It came out about a year and a half after that. And most bands sort of do something every two years, give or take, or, you know, around that. I know sometimes bands will take their time, as we see with quite a few bands in the scene now. They sort of just have a little more freedom. And this album received even better reviews than The Upsides did. So for you, what was it about this album that kept you listening to the band and kept you coming back to this record? I mean, I think sort of like every album is like really organic growth, which is, you know, that's all a band can really ask for. Um, so I think that's like a big part of it is it was just like a continuation of the upsides, you know, continuing to refine the pop punk sound, continuing to push the personal lyrics, continuing everything that you already loved about the upsides. And then sort of upping the game a little bit. Um, you know, the title is actually from an Allen Ginsberg poem. And they have three tracks, Suburbia, I've Given You All, and Now I'm Nothing, uh, throughout the album that are all sort of build upon each other with the ending being, you know, like another just amazing ending. Like it has sort of all the kind of sections and everything you would want from that. Um, so I think that like, you know, having that through line throughout the album also really helped like connect with people, you know, like it's not just songs. It's not like a playlist. It's like it feels like a cohesive album and it kind of, you know, has your attention as that rather than what it, other albums tend to be. Yeah. And this being the introductory album to the band for me it was a really great place to start. And I know when we started this, I mentioned for the sake of discussion, starting at the beginning. But I think if you're going to just want to start listening to the band in general and you haven't listened to them too much, this might be sort of the best place to start. And then you could probably, you know, listen to this. And then I would say listen to the upsides just to get a feel of where this album came from and then listen to some of the newer stuff. I, I'm guessing you can probably skip Get Stoked On It if <laughs> you really want to, because, you know, for me, when I listened to that album, it didn't really do much for me because I already knew what the more recent stuff sounded like. So I think this is definitely probably the best place to start if you are a new listener to The Wonder Years. And if you're still listening to this podcast about halfway through and have not listened to The Wonder Years, first, thank you. And second, you should probably go do that. <laughs> I definitely agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, is there anything else you want to hit on for Suburbia? Because I know this is a huge album for them and it sort of gave them that fresh start on Hopeless, too. Yeah. I mean, uh, sort of bringing it to the live sense also, um, this was like their first, you know, like, medium-sized room headliner tours and they were selling out um i went to a matinee show that they added after the night show sold out in new york city and they played the album in full um and i think they had to do that with at least two or three other dates on that tour so you know in addition to the music like their live persona had just been growing and catching on and i think sort of that really like came together to you know make it as big of a hit as it was yeah and this is definitely a very enjoyable album and like you mentioned i didn't know that about the title at all so that is definitely an interesting fact and the fact that they split that up into 
three songs. Obviously, you know, that's something noticeable if you go through and look through the track listing that, you know, hey, they split up the title of the album into three songs instead of having a single title track like most bands will do. But definitely check this one out and start with it if you haven't yet. But before we move on to their more recent albums, I want to tell you all a little more about Vinyl Me Please. So for you, the listeners of Welcome to Geekdom, Vinyl Me Please is a vinyl record of the month club. It's the best record club. In fact, every month, Vinyl Me Please features one album that is essential to the modern vinyl collection and sends it to thousands of their members worldwide. And you don't have to get every single record. You can pick and choose. They are very flexible with the subscription service and everything like that. But if you want to just sort of create this eclectic vinyl collection, you could just stay signed up and get a ton of different albums and everything like that. And included in the package is an original 12 by 12 album inspired art print and they pair it with a cocktail recipe that sort of goes with the mood of the album. So again, the link for that is joinvmp.com forward slash geekdom. And like I said, I will have that in the show notes so you don't have to worry about it. And I definitely recommend checking this out if you are a big vinyl collector and Scott, I'm sure you can agree that you've seen some stuff on Vinyl Me Please and you're just like, wow, that is definitely a great release to get. Oh, yeah, they've definitely. Had, they've had like a lot of big ones lately, too, uh, especially like the Gorillaz album that they did a couple months ago. Yeah, and they don't get stuff that's too far out there. They'll definitely still bring you some artists you are familiar with and everything like that. So Be sure to check that out. And again, the link is joinvmp.com forward slash geekdom. It'll be in the show notes and everything. And thank you to Vinyl Me Please for sponsoring this episode. But now we are going to get back to the Wonder Years and we are going to move on to The Greatest Generation, which is their album from 2013. So it came out the same year as that Sleeping on Trash collection did. And I think... You know, that seems kind of like unfortunate timing because, like you said, they didn't have really any hand in the collection of songs that No Sleep released because those came out in February and then this album came out only a few months later in May. So obviously they were definitely focused on, you know, singles for this album and everything like that. So What were your initial thoughts on this album when it came out? Did you think it was a good step from Suburbia? Yeah, um, actually, I think it was the first single that was released from it was the second track, Passing Through a Screen Door. Yeah. And I remember when it was being premiered, they announced, oh, it's going to be premiered at whatever time on Absolute Punk. Uh, Maybe five to seven minutes before that time, the site crashed and it was down for I want to say close to an hour before they finally just posted it on Tumblr to get it out there. Um, So this was kind of like peak pop punk wonder years. I mean, that song is such a jam and people wanted to hear it so badly that they crashed absolute punk and kept it down. So, I mean, just as a start to the record cycle, that was like amazing. (laughs) Yeah. And absolute punk was a huge site. And for anyone who somehow doesn't know this yet absolute punk is now chorus fm and while it's not the same feel as absolute punk there's still you know the forums and a lot of traffic and everything like that but there was something about absolute punk around this time period where you know people would sort of just go really crazy for anything that the site premiered especially something like this and I don't recall if in 2013 things had already been moved over to spin and that whole debacle and everything like that, but you have Thomas Nassif reviewing this album for Absolute Punk, and he gave it, you know, basically a perfect score there. So this album just really kept that same hype going from Suburbia, too. Yeah, for sure. I mean... And, you know, going back to talking about, like, the growth between albums, 
I mean, it had some of the heaviest stuff they've done, like the bastards, the bul- the vultures, the wolves. And then it also had like kind of their first actual like ballad with the devil in my bloodstream. So, I mean, it continued on that path and just, you know, also tore it wide open, you know, expanding their sound in such an awesome way. Yeah. And I was actually mistaken on that. Thomas didn't even give it a rating because he thought the (laughs) record was so good. So I think that just goes to show how much people were really enjoying this. And I am going to apologize to Thomas just in case he's listening to this. That was (laughs) my mistake. I can't read apparently. (laughs) But um, I mean, sort of, it's really interesting to me, like the upsides kind of started off like surface level self problems. And then um, suburbia was like kind of problems within your like with you as part of your community and then this album kind of like taking the name from the greatest generation like the world war ii generation it takes a look at sort of like your place as a whole like in the world um so i mean i think it kind of is like a trilogy of personal growth um and it's like really interesting it makes each album feel like a step forward And it also makes the albums like really cohesive as a whole. Yeah. And one thing I want to note that is very obvious in this album, just reading off the track listing and everything, you sort of get this vivid imagery because you have songs like The Devil in My Bloodstream and I Just Want to Sell Out My Funeral. And it's like before you even hear the song, you can sort of get a feel for what direction it's going to go in. And I really love it when just song titles alone can tell a story in itself. And they do a really good job with that. And I don't think every song title necessarily needs to be like super descriptive and super long like a lot of fallout boy ones can be (laughs) but they do a nice job here of giving you these sort of little tidbits within the song titles too for sure and you know how i was mentioning like sort of the through line in suburbia right there was like a similar one in this album they actually had seven inches that they pressed for dismantling summer with a different sort of symbol from the album on each. They have a ghost, a pill bottle, birds, bombs, and the devil, which were all sort of, you know, mentioned in songs throughout the album. And then it all culminated with, I just want to sell out my funeral, which literally pays tribute within it. It's a seven and a half minute song. And it, you know, has little pieces from, basically every song on the album and that's what as far as i remember that's what they use as their closer currently and it's like it's such an epic song and it really you know sums up the album and makes it kind of like a sore yeah and the fact that they were able to go from suburbia which a lot of people already thought was great and just bring something new to this and even better to this album goes to show, like you said, how much they were able to mature with their songwriting. And a lot of fans will sort of want the same thing from a band. And I know you've probably heard this with bands like Yellow Card and some other of the bigger bands in the scene where if they switch things up or try something new, there's always going to be those fans that kind of go crazy over it. But I think if there's no maturity as the band does release after release after release, it sort of just becomes stagnant. And I think what The Wonder Years does really well is they keep their sound, but they still find a way to add something to their records they know who they are as a band and they know they're a pop punk band and they definitely know how to run with that and keep things interesting and keep people wanting to listen to their music yeah i definitely agree with that i think probably part of it is you know the fact that they did start out as a joke band right it's like they really once they decided to take it seriously i think they like felt like they had something to prove um and then just kind of ran with it i actually um i I don't know if this quote was from dan campbell or from someone else but about him but um it was something along the lines of oh every time 
he has to write a he goes to write a record all he has to do is write about the last 12 months of his life <laughs> which is pretty accurate but there's also a lot of growth in there yeah and when you have bands like this more often than not they are writing about their lives it's not like they're having their songs written by other people like you see a lot in say country music or pop music you know these are things that are very focused on what's going on in their lives at that point in time when they start writing the songs and recording the songs and everything like that so you're always sort of going to get that with these smaller bands that don't have like an army of songwriters (laughs) to work with and everything like that and I think that's a lot of what makes parts of this genre so enjoyable because they keep it real and they keep it true to themselves more often than not. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, for me, at least, I think the Wonder Years were like the first band that I really realized were doing that. Like they made it so personal. Everything was like me and I and we like, I don't know that I really had that sort of or at least connected it before with a band. So I think that, you know, extremely personal connection is something that, you know, really made them stand out and also kind of inspired a whole bunch of other bands that are doing the same thing now. Yeah. And I think that's sort of a good place to start talking about No Closer to Heaven because we're talking about them maturing as they write and trying new things. And this album came about when Dan was you know, in a writer's block funk. And he ended up making probably more of a concept album than they had ever done. Not probably, they definitely made this more of a concept album than they had ever done. And the whole album just flows really well. I went back and listened to this one because, you know, I was already familiar with Suburbia, some of the upsides and The Greatest Generation. So I wanted to go back, listen to their first album that I hadn't heard before, and then sort of just give myself a refresher on this album. Because to be honest, I don't think I listened to this album too much because by 2015, I was already like deep in the podcast rabbit hole. And (laughs) like I said, my music listening habits have become very off and very weird as of late. So I did listen to the album when it came out and listening to it again now, I was like, yeah, you know, I did enjoy this record when it came out and it was definitely different. What were you feeling when you first heard this album? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of the first album that I wasn't immediately crazy about when I first heard it. Right. I was actually interning at Big Picture Media at the time, who does all their PR. Um, And I had the opportunity to go to an in-store, Apple Store um, Q&A slash acoustic performance. Um, And they played um, Cigarettes and Saints. And that was when it really clicked for me. Um, Like, all these songs translate so well live that, like, that's almost my preferred way to listen to them. Um, It's sort of the most, uh, like the biggest departure in sound that they've had in any of their albums. It's, you know, much darker um, in places. There's only maybe like two or three songs that I would actually call like straight up pop punk, which would be, you know, like, um, I don't like who I was then and thanks for the ride. And also the album version is sort of, I feel like it's, I don't know the exact terminology, what it would be. I feel like the mastering might be a little different than how they typically do it. Like the drums and occasionally the vocals seem buried in a way that at least immediately didn't make sense. Now, like listening back, now that I know the songs better, it like I can pick out the parts. But initially I was a little bit disappointed in especially the drums. Cause like I mentioned on the upsides, like, that was part of what really drew me in was Kennedy's like amazing drum parts. So, you know, this was like kind of the first wavering I had with the band, but it's something that really grew on me. And you mentioned um, Thomas's review of The Greatest Generation. I believe No Closer to Heaven was actually his final review for Absolute Punk. And he did give it a perfect score, basically saying, 
I may not think it's the best album now, but I know it's going to grow on me and I know it's going to be the best album until the next one comes out. Yeah. And I think with this album too, it, like you said, it's definitely something that has to grow on you. And I think with this release, I might even have to go revisit it some more after we wrap this up and everything. Maybe not necessarily today, but you know, in the near future, because I feel like with their discography, there's a lot to focus on and a lot that you can take out of it. And I think this one is definitely something you sort of have to listen to as a whole, simply because it is that kind of concept album and it has this running theme of talking about losing a loved one. And while a lot of albums will have sort of overall themes to them, this one feels like it's really ingrained into each song that you listen to. So I typically listen to albums as a whole anyway. I'm not much of a let me pick a single here and there unless I'm just sort of listening to music to listen to music. Then I'll put a playlist on and, you know, maybe I don't want to have to think about it. But are you the same way where you want to listen to albums in full instead of just picking and choosing a bunch of different songs? Yeah, I definitely am. I mean, almost exclusively, you know, like every once in a while, if I'm like the passenger in a car and I'm getting antsy, maybe I'll switch up the albums. But um, I really do. I enjoy, you know, the experience of, you know, in one sitting, taking in what an artist wants to present to you the way they want to present it for, you know, most likely the next two years. Um, I think it, especially with a lot of the types of music that we listen to, you know, like the pop punk and emo genres, um, I, I feel like that's such an important thing because it's so important to the artist that it should also be important to the fans. Yeah, definitely. And this album came out in 2015. So it's feeling like we're sort of due for something new. But as this being their most recent album, do you find that you have a preference when you go to listen to The Wonder Years now? Do you automatically go to this album or do you still go and revisit, you know, Suburbia and The Greatest Generation just as often, if not more? Yeah, I think I listen to them all pretty evenly. Okay. I mean, I think just because of when it hit me, The Upsides is probably my favorite album. But talking kind of unbiased, I think Suburbia might be their best. They're all top notch, though. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. They've been very consistent since the Upsides hit. And while it maybe didn't get quite as much attention as Suburbia did when they made the switch to Hopeless, they've released solid records every time they've released something since they, like you said, started taking this seriously. And I think with No Closer to Heaven, there's just something about the album where you're like, okay, they are absolutely taking this seriously and they don't want to be just another pop punk band. You know, you can listen to different pop punk bands like The Wonder Years, Yellow Card, Blink-182, and you will get totally different feels from those bands. And I would say, you know, those three might be some of the ones that you would often see as like the top bands for the genre and everything like that. But they're not trying to sound like every other pop punk band and i think you'll see that a lot with some newer bands where they try to be like the wonder years or something like that and it's just something that i don't know if anyone else can do it as well as the wonder years have and if they ever will basically yeah i mean especially with you know like we've been saying throughout like their constant moving forward um i think it's kind of impossible to replicate their sound as a whole maybe like you can replicate the sound of the upsides or the sound of suburbia if you want but you can't really know where they're going next which is you know that's part of what makes it so exciting to have a band like this yeah and speaking of not really knowing where they're going next i actually wanted to do a little bit of speculation on what you think is coming next for the band do you think they're going to announce something soon i know because of the fact that it's, you know, two years later here from No Closer to Heaven, a lot of people are like, okay, you know, it's kind of that time for another release. So what are your thoughts on sort of hitting that every two year release schedule? Do you prefer that? Or are you perfectly okay with bands taking their time to give you what they're working on next? I mean, I'm cool with the band doing whatever they need to do to, you know, deliver 
what they want and deliver like the best product. Um, I think uh, they, I think like half the band got married pretty recently okay. and they pretty much took the summer off from touring. They played like a one-off show with Rise Against and a couple of festivals in the UK, but I believe they're starting to, they've been writing and are starting to rehearse more often now. So I'm guessing hopefully they'll be hitting the studio soon and we'll be seeing something maybe early 2017 mid 2017 hopefully well it is mid 2017 so i assume you're talking about uh, 2018, 2018. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there we go all good i do that all the time i'm like wait it's 2017 are we sure and <laughs> you know once the year changes over it's still like 2017 for a good few months or whatever <laughs> so it's okay but just because The Wonder Years directly haven't been doing any or haven't released anything. I'm sure they've been working plenty. Dan has definitely been keeping busy. He started his side project, Aaron West in the Roaring Twenties, back in 2014 and put something out in between The Greatest Generation and No Closer to Heaven. So we got something from him and then he released something last year too with bittersweet so even though it was just an ep you know he he sort of still has these wheels turning and you know he's working on new music all the time pretty much so what were your thoughts when you found out that he was doing a solo project were you worried about what that would mean for the wonder years or were you pretty much aware right away that it was like hey dan's just gonna try out this other thing for a bit Uh, i was definitely excited for it from the start i'm not sure if he said it immediately or not but it's actually the aaron west project is a character he made right and sort of you know like method acting he sort of on stage he is in character he is aaron west playing the songs and He, you know, journaled extensively before even writing the album as the character and then took pieces of that life that he made for him and turned it into the album. So, I mean, I see it as something totally different from The Wonder Years and something that, you know, gets his creative juices flowing in a different way. Um, And I really enjoy both the albums he's put out. I've seen a couple of times live and it's been a really interesting experience, like I said, like seeing him as, you know, He's like uncomfortable on stage. He's sad. He just got divorced. And like, it's a different experience, but a really cool one. Yeah. And it's not just another pop punk project either. So you don't really have to worry about this, you know, taking songs away from the Wonder Years or anything like that, because it's more of a indie folk rock sort of thing. It definitely has a different sound to it than any of the Wonder Years stuff. And When I first heard about it, I don't know if I was necessarily worried on what that meant for the Wonder Years, because it seems like these days a lot of people do side projects. I mean, look at Billy Joe from Green Day. He has side projects and Green Day is huge. So if he can make it work, I'm sure, you know, the Wonder Years and Dan can make him having a side project work. And I definitely enjoy this and I'm interested to see what he comes up next with it but you brought it to my attention that there are other side projects from other band members so have you taken the time to dive into those or is Aaron West sort of the main side project that you've listened to Aaron West is definitely the biggest one um actually I think it was in like maybe 2009 originally uh that Nick it might have even been before he was in the band I don't know he released um an EP as schedule of no plan which is it's like a really mathy instrumental band with like a lot of loops and stuff and then i probably found out about it when he released another one um and that one's like cool it's kind of cool to chill out to sometimes um he also has another side project called why bother which is sort of like a fuzzed out darker rock um there's a couple of songs of that that i really enjoy a lot and it's interesting he was actually like the main songwriter for that band, the premiere before the one year started. So it's interesting to see, you know, his approach to songwriting and lyric writing come out a little bit more. And then more recently, uh, Matt Brash started a band called Cold Climate, which is, it's probably the most similar to 
the Wonder Years. It's sort of like a maybe a slightly down tempo rock band. Um, I think it's with this other members of this other band called the Sixties that the Wonder Years are friends with, and that that one's really good. And also, Mike Kennedy has a project called MDK, which he um, it was actually recorded with Cam from Soror. You know, it's kind of like a lo-fi, a little bit kind of like a little bit folky, not like Aaron West though. Um, and I didn't really listen to that one much, but it's interesting. <laughs> but it's it's really cool, you know, to see them all kind of finding their own ways to express themselves out of the band. I mean, I know before the Wonder Years started, Nick was in like four or five different like hardcore bands in the Philly scene. So it's really good that they're like able to do that in the downtime from the Wonder Years. Yeah, and I'll definitely have to check out some of those side projects. I just didn't have quite enough time to really dive into those. And I know we wanted to more so focus on the Wonder Years as their band and that project and everything like that. I don't know if you could even call it a project because they are a band that is very active and it's sort of like the main thing they're all doing. (laughs) But, you know, I think this was definitely a great conversation. I definitely learned some stuff. Is there anything we've missed that you wanted to touch on that I didn't get to? Um, I just want to give a couple shout outs to their sort of like B sides and covers. Okay. The living room song was on originally on the Japanese version of uh, Suburbia and ended up being on like the deluxe re-release. That song is like it's like a fan favorite. I think um, they I think they play it live with some regularity. Uh, that one's really awesome. And then all of their covers are really great. Um, especially they have a Kid Dynamite cover of i think it's cheap shots youth anthems and it's like an older one so it's more of the get stoked on it style of pop punk but it like has so much energy and it's so much fun and really like like i said all their b-sides and uh covers are you know i would recommend listening to them after the main albums of course but they're all like really great in my opinion yeah definitely and doing this podcast has made me want to sort of try and revisit their music more often than I do. And, you know, I think I'm just going to have to figure something out here and like, you know, unsubscribe from a few more podcasts, (laughs) make some more time for music, because I'll listen to something new, like I mentioned with No Closer to Heaven. And it's like, I'll listen to it once, maybe twice. And then I just sort of get so distracted with all the other new stuff coming out and all the other albums that I want to revisit that it's like I can't revisit everything as much as I want to. So I think I need to get a little better at like, okay, instead of listening to a playlist, I'll go listen to this album because, (laughs) you know, it's sort of upbeat enough for when I'm, you know, out on the exercise bike or treadmill or something like that, because I can't listen to (laughs) slow songs when I'm doing that. Even if I'm just like walking, I'm like, nope, need something a little more upbeat here. So I think the Wonder Years definitely falls into that category. For sure. And I also just wanted to give another quick headlight to there's um, a podcast that Dan did a couple years ago called Resume. It kind of filled in a lot of the gaps that I had for the early years of the Wonder Years. So it was like really interesting. And I would definitely recommend that one because it sort of gives, you know, a look at their roots to make you, like I said, see where they come to today. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And we'll find that and link to it. So you guys don't have to like go searching the depths of Google for it or anything like that. (laughs) And like I said, this episode was sponsored by Vinyl Me Please. And we are very thankful for that. If you guys just go try it out, you will also be helping out the podcast. It's a pretty easy way to help out the podcast. Because if you are interested in vinyl, you are probably already going to buy them. So just go through our link Again, that'll be in the show notes. And Scott, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. I always love nerding out about stuff I love. Definitely. That's the whole point of the show. And to our listeners, as always, thank you guys for listening. If you enjoy this episode, share it on Twitter, Facebook, just get the word out about it. We would love to, you know, let everyone know about this podcast. And as always, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>